All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm so happy to be here today with uh, the Board of Foundations for Divergent Minds, Osman Latimer, Marena K. Giwa Alnaiwu, Kasiana Asamasu, and Menali Martin. And before I introduce them, um, just our usual notes that we're live on YouTube right now. Uh, the recording is available anytime after this. Um, we do have the chat option um, on YouTube and love to hear about you. So please feel free to share if you are comfortable. Um, today's format is interview style. So we encourage you to ask questions through the conversation and I'll get to as many as we can. Um, and just be sure to subscribe to the page because that's what will allow you to post in the chat. Um, so now to introduce the board of FDM. Uh, again, it's Oswin, Cassiana, Marenike, and Menely. And Foundations for Divergent Minds is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization rooted in the principles of disability justice. It's founded and led by multiply neurodivergent autistic people whose mission is to ensure equity, access, and fulfilled lives through inclusive, practical, and affirming neurodiversity-based programming and education. It's headquartered in Texas, and FDM uses, utilizes effective, innovative, digital, culturally responsive methods to serve a diverse range of individuals, families, organizations, and providers across the globe. Um, so before we talk more about FDM and all that they do and how they can help your kids or your loved one or your student, um, we actually had asked them to come on with us um, after a statement that they had released um, about uh, their organization um, being plagiarized. So um, would I'm not sure who wants to start, but maybe one of you wants to tell us a little bit more about that before we get into everything else. So uh, yes, uh, we the FDM framework was something that we built over time and um, developed all the way and released in 2018. And so like that's how we founded the organization. Um, but one of our previous uh, course uh, participants, uh, Rachel Dorsey, uh, utilized our framework to build her course off of um, through Live, Play, Thrive. And uh, while we had some back and forth, it became clear that she was never going to credit us as, um, or that she wasn't going to credit us as the, uh, the basis of what she was um, doing with her course. Um, she has since come out with a statement and said that, um, yes, she did plagiarize us. And um, that was released just after Thanksgiving. Um, and so like, but it was this really, really disheartening experience to have to go through for, I think all of us, um, because uh, we don't, I don't know if somebody else wants to say something about it, but like, I, I feel like we just, we don't have um, the structural benefits <laughs> so, that a clinician does. Yeah. A lot of what was disheartening for me sitting there watching was actually all of these, um, I'm going to say it, all of these white people telling her, oh, you don't need to apologize. You're being bullied into apologizing for plagiarizing. And I have been in a school recently. There are still there are still statements of academic integrity. Those are still a thing that exists. And so the vocal a vocal chunk of the community was saying standards and being expected to follow standards is bullying, it is ableism, it is oppressive. It is the means. As in M E E N Z. It is super mean that these um, largely people of color and these queer people are holding you to a standard. That was like a really loud thing. 
And we couldn't say anything without it being the worst thing that anybody has ever done any ever. It was like, it was that. Like, have you ever been the kid um, who uh, in school told a bully, you don't get to do that to me and you possibly did it by pushing them after they pushed you? It was that. You get suspended for fighting back. So, um, yeah. So do you guys want to talk more? Because um, I think where some of the breakdown happened is people don't fully appreciate the, um, the differences in privilege and, like you said, the structural advantages and um, like when you don't have institutional support for an organization like yourself, um, it, you do have a lot less power in and funding and, um, reach potentially than, you know, another organization or, you know, field that may have more. Um, and I, I remember, um, in your, in your statement, uh, about the incident, you said, quote, the power dynamics and of privilege that are at play in this scenario cannot be ignored, unquote. So do you want to explain that a little bit more? Um, go ahead, Monica. Okay, we can't okay, hear so you. Y'all can't hear me? Okay, there you go. There okay, you. my volume is jacked up, so. Okay. <laughs> You know, Jen, I really appreciate you bringing this up because I think one of the things for us that was very disheartening um, is that this is the type of thing that we get that plays itself over again and again and again throughout one's life. So by virtue of the lives that we live, not by choice, um, we've had to become resilient. We've had to adapt. We've had to learn things that we wish we didn't have to know. <laughs> you know, a lot of the, this, the, um, you know, a lot of what we've accomplished, you know, the awareness that we have, you know, was developed out of you know, painful experiences. And so um, as our community, you know, we're not old, but we were sort of elders in our community, despite that. And so as people are, you know, as more people are developing an understanding of their neurology and, and you know, parents, allies, et cetera, as the community grows, um, what we've always wanted to do is embrace and welcome people and, you know, mentor and nurture them so they don't have to um, learn by putting their hand on the stove, you know, the way that we did and so forth. And so we've always considered it an, an honor when someone um, is inspired by a concept that we've shared and, you know, builds on it, takes it further and makes change in their community. But it's also completely disrespectful. It's almost like a sense of entitlement. I guess I'll give an example. Um, there are children or there are people, there's like a whole generation of people who think that, um, you know, full lips and hips and big butt are from the Kardashians. <laughs> like they made that the thing. When some of us, that's our genetically, you know, the body that we had without surgery. That's just us. There was a time when we all got teased for those features that they paid for. And so it's like co-opting. No one, you can be inspired by something, but you should still give the attribution to the source. That's how things grow. That's that's what we should do. We do with everything. And it feels that people are trying to use, you know, really, really unscrupulous means to get around that. Like, well, oh, that's the highest form of flattery. Or, oh, that was so such a paradigm shift for me that I incorporated into the way I think in my practice and now it's mine. And that's yeah. not the way it works. And people of color and for people and, and um, people assigned female at birth have always for all of our lives been expected to, you know, be the brainchild and the innovator for someone else to come take the credit and not to give us any, you know, and that's just not the way things work. We want you to, we want that, that the idea to spread, but it's hurtful, it's disrespectful, but sadly not surprising, <laughs> you know, when this happens. The surprising part was that the person actually admitted it, but what was hurtful is that there were a lot of behind the scenes conversations before we went public, because that was never our desire. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of young up and coming people who are trying to do things and they're learning and they're gonna make their mistakes and Lord knows we've made our mistakes. <laughs> and, and so it's not about that. Like if, when we tried to handle it internally and we were given assurance and promises that things would be addressed a certain way. And when that was reneged upon, that's when we felt like we had no choice 
you know, but to go public. And it becomes frustrating having to be the whistleblower all the time. Let's, you know, sometimes sunshine is the best iodine. I also think like part of this, uh, the, the way I see it, because I've been, I've now been working so much with clinicians for the past couple of years, just trying to get people like into a neurodiversity mindset that um, we don't have an SLP on staff. We don't have one on the board. We don't have an OT on the board. We don't have any of these service providers. So like being able to offer things like CEUs, it's just not accessible to us. We don't right. have that form of structural privilege, which it automatically boosts their, uh, the other up um, as, okay, this is the one that I can point to and say, this is evidence-based. Well, guess what? Ours is too. Like, uh, we, what we've pulled together here draws on so much different fields of research. Um, and it's knowledge and it's not just knowledge, it's cultural responsive knowledge because we have been part of the community for forever. <laughs> like Cassiana is like, was a baby when the neurodiversity movement was a baby. <laughs> Yeah. Me just jumping in here and they're like, hi, I'm barely old enough for the internet and here I am. Yeah. Um, that it, was a choice. <laughs> I regret it. it. So, <laughs> no, you uh, don't. You found me. <laughs> there's that. Yes. So I don't um, regret it. <laughs> uh, like, I know. Sorry, like mentally has been part of the online autistic community since 2002, 2003. Cassiana has been since 1996. 1999. 99, sorry. Upside down. I see what you did there. <laughs> um, I started in 09. Marina K, what, in 2010? We've just been around a really long time. So our so what we have and what we've developed is not just based off of a history of writing, which yes, it is, but that's because that thought development we've been part of and we've been guiding for so long that it made sense to conceptualize it into something that everyone else could use. That's like why we exist. Right. And then for somebody to take that and offer it as a for-profit product, especially with all the structural and institutional support that we can't have because of who we are. Like we are just innately not those people. We're not those people because right. of not having something like this. Like, <laughs> yeah. And um, I want to say, it's not just as, as frustrating as Rachel is, there's like other pages that um, I'm not going to name because they're not on our thing, but where we've had similar types of issues where like the institutional power dynamic is so obvious that like Oswin and Cassiana get banned instantaneously. And I am just mean and because I'm white and Cassiana and Oswin are not. <laughs> And, and the, the power dynamic difference of being white versus not in autistic spaces is so obvious. And we can't keep ignoring that in these spaces. Yeah. Well, I mean, a popular um, reason that people give about in autistic spaces because there are people who will go into autistic spaces and they will tell you that they are triggered by either people of color or by racialized you know specific racialized um behaviors or habits that are innocuous mm -hmm. um and they will say oh well i'm autistic i can't help it excuse me no you are racist you <laughs> are racist you can't say that I'm autistic. I am the admin of this autistic only page. <laughs> you are racist. 
<laughs> it, it is sad. a thing. It's, it's a huge thing, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, like it's funny. It's almost kind of like for less an inside joke, like, you know, mentally is like our superpower because <laughs> it can go into like groups and um, almost without trying to, but almost like an insider to figure out what the tone is or people, what people really think and say. Um, um, and, and, you know, you would like to think that with all of the things going on in this world, um, that we would have evolved to a point as people um, to where we can, you know, have, give credit and respect to people for their contributions, regardless of their background. But that isn't the way that it works. And I, um, I find the, the reason why we made, you know, and I think, we, you know, we made it clear in our statement, we appreciate Rachel's apology. Um, and um, this situation and this having happened numerous times, this is not the first or the second or the fifth. Miranda K, can you go closer to your microphone? Oh, shoot. Sorry. I hate my You're good. Uh, is this okay? Sort of? No. No. Okay. I'm going to mute, let y'all talk, and I'll type what I'm going to say. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so we'll wait for Miranda wow. K to type. Can I just yeah. say one thing, Osmond, before you go on? Um, we had a question that uh, came into email asking, what does FDM do? Do they support adults? Do they provide support and advocacy for autistics who are non-speaking? Um, and they want to make sure that they didn't miss anything. So I just want to let that person know that we will be um, getting to all of that. Um, we were just, you know, starting with some background information here and kind of the advocacy and autistic organization space, but we will definitely get to that as well. Um, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No, quite right. Um, uh, okay. You're coming back to the point that you were making. Okay. Um, that makes, uh, I think also with, um, with the terms of like the, the power dynamics, it, you know what? I think we can, do we want to move on from this part and go into the next section? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that, hey, hey, y'all are racist is like its own webinar. <laughs> 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 um, if we're being yeah. honest here. Um, maybe one more point I would love for you to touch on is um, being considered autistic elders and because you've all been in this space for so long. Um, I, I have seen a lot of people talk about kind of like the cycling that happens with autistic advocates as they, you know, come into this space, they get burnt out, they have to leave. Um, you have all somehow endured. Um, I'm, a, I'm curious how you <laughs> maintain, you know, the ability to subject yourselves uh, to this for so long. And then, we you know, don't. what do you want to say to the new people? Okay. You're going to hate my answer. Okay. So we okay. don't, we don't stay here. <laughs> like, um, okay. mm -hmm. like uh, I've crashed and burned out twice in my career. Like just period. It's happened twice. <laughs> uh, and that's like 13 years I've crashed twice. So <laughs> it's just, it's people think that's what's happening. What's actually happening is like, I can't not. Mm -hmm. I can't not do this. One, I don't have any marketable skills to do anything but this and live in capitalism with my kids as a single parent. Like I can't, I, I have to do this. Right. Um, so that survival is a really big thing for me. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, for me, I am privileged enough that back before I burnt out the first time I joined the military so the military thinks I'm crazy and they pay me so um I I don't I do it because um I want to and all I do is um tone it down to hope anymore um and I only do that 10 times a year so I do the foundation and tone it down to hope. And that is pretty much it. I, I don't have the energy or the, or the 
mental capacity to do what I used to anymore. Um, I think almost everybody who stays in any kind of advocacy starts out strong yeah. and then realizes that you can't. You, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you want to, you want to change the world. You come in and you want to change the world and you realize you can't. Um, you want to. And the world doesn't want to change. So I have a funny answer and an answer you're going to hate. And you get both. <laughs> so the funny answer is I'm powered by spite. <laughs> the answer you're going to hate is I'm an ABA survivor. So I don't bang my head for self-harm anymore. I engage with autism parents. Y'all are my uh, self-harm mechanism of choice. You're welcome. And honestly, my community that is allergic to learning because it hurts their feelings to hear that they're not always right is my other self-harm mechanism of choice. And yes, that is me saying RSD discourse is a pile of nonsense. And y'all need to like start to acknowledge that people who aren't you are people. I mean, we all have trauma. We all mm -hmm. have significant yeah. trauma. Yeah. Um, and if we can just get around the idea that RSD and PDA and ODD mm -hmm. are, are the trauma responses, then we're going to continue to have. Um, yeah. uh, this is why- And I just want to clarify for anyone watching Oswin. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just, right. So RSD is rejection sensitive rejection, dysphoria. Yeah, it's so, rejection re sensitive dysphoria and it is the current- um, clinicalized term for um being told that i hurt somebody else makes me feel so bad that i'm going to lash out at them and make me take care of them about that hurting my feelings um, um that might be unfair but i don't think it is like 90 percent of adhd people have rsd it's a trauma response. And if we can mm -hmm. get around the fact that it's a trauma response, then we can start to think about it in terms of how can we heal from that trauma so we're not lashing out at people and can and starting the cycle back up again. Like this is an abuse cycle. <laughs> yeah. It's it's be it's a it is a term that is grossly abused in our community. Um, and is, in fact, what we saw in the plagiarism thing that got us here. I pro like I said, I promised that that had a point. I'm not just being mean. It is a thing that had a point. I'm uh, rarely just mean. Um, I don't think I'm ever just mean. I guess it gets away from the question of it does. how do we how do we how do we stay doing this for so long? Ooh. Powered by spite. We have to like. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, if we uh, don't do it, nobody will. And just to say that, um, like, it does come at such a high cost, mm -hmm. you know, to stay in this space. But at the same time, like, you really, there's nothing that compares to the experience and, you know, the, the history that you all are very aware of. Um, and, you know, there, it does seem like there is so much um, infighting within the autistic community. There's also infighting within the parent communities. And like, you know, it's unfortunate because we, in order for us to be able to move forward in a less ableist world, um, you know, like, the autistic community can't afford to fracture itself. And I, I hate Jen, can I inter way, but... Can I interrupt you before I lose this thought? Please. Okay. Um, I think like I get, I, I feel like where you're getting at with this is that we're talking about, we keep on having these cycles of new people and we, and you hear, you see that we're still here and we are able to somehow keep going, which what we do isn't healthy. Let's not pretend mm -hmm. like what we do is healthy. It um, is not. Uh, I, I have this, this end goal of like, when I die, I know we will be an inch closer. Like, this is what keeps me going is knowing that by the time that it ends, we will be an inch closer. Yeah. 
Um, but when we have new people come up and they co-opt work and not just ours, like the entire community's work and have this very precursory, I've just learned all this. Now I'm going to speak to the bigger picture. Well, you haven't really done enough work on yourself to really even do that without knowing what you're doing, whether what you're saying is damaging or not. Like there's a reason it took 10 years after my diagnosis before I created this. Because it takes a long time to really figure out what it, what is awesome, what is my trauma, and how do I make that not happen again? Yeah. To a whole generation of people. Yeah. And you do get it from all sides because you do get some heat from the autistic community. You get heat from parents, from clinicians, um, you know, like, like I've said this to some of you in the past, but like as a neurotypical parent of two children, um, one of which is autistic, I knew nothing. And the, like, when I started hearing autistic stories, that was like the first time that I felt permission to not, uh, not feel so pressured from, you know, the, the narrative that is being like pumped down onto new parents. Um, and it's like, like I, Admittedly, I was not aware of disability justice before this. And like, that bothers me. And it's, you know, none of us get any background in this in school or even in, um, you know, teacher prep programs. It's really not uh, taught unless you're specifically like, you know, in disability studies. So, you know, the fact that all of you live this and have been such a part of this for such time, it really is so incredibly valuable. And the irony is, like you said, with a lack of institutionalized support. So like if people don't get professional credit for like taking your course, let's say, they may be less likely. But the reason that you have not yet been able to do that is because you are an autistic organization who does not get institutionalized support that neurotypical or, you know, science organizations would get. Um, and so like, I, like, I just want to bring up that barrier because there is a real inequity for the type of support that autistic ex expertise offers um, and can provide to the community, to all of our kids, to adults. Um, and that is not supported on an institutional level. It's not. Um, if, it's, if I can jump in, I had to switch to my yeah. phone because my computer's just, ugh. Um, so Jen, I really appreciate what you stated because like I, um, you know, I'm in the interesting position of kind of, um, you know, all of us, you know, I think most people in general, you know, have a lot of identities, wear a lot of different hats. But in my situation, you know, I first came into this as a parent, you know, um, with my daughter's diagnosis and then my son's. My, um, I didn't, you know, my diagnosis of autism came later. And, um, and, you know, it was during that period when I was trying to figure out what was going on with my children. And when I was, you know, really, you know, seeking some type of other narrative other than the you know, stigmatizing one that was so prevalent, it, this is what made me go to graduate school because I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm tired of people trying to, you know, like manipulate me or, you know, mm -hmm. not, you know, you, you know, I was tired of everything being a fight. I wanted to be able to have some baseline of knowledge because I had come from the, you know, the nonprofit sector, um, refugee resettlement, it was a completely different world. And so, um, and then an HIV research. And so I came in, you know, and so I just, I learned a lot on the fly. And I found that um, in my affiliations with various different groups, you know, like right now I'm doing double duty. I'm in an IACC meeting and, and you know, that was set, this uh, meeting that we set was prior to that one. So I'm doing that and I have a, you know, a peer review due later and all of this kind of stuff. And so all of the little, you know, things that all of the privileges that you get, like when Mentally was talking about um, the, you know, being white and the privilege, um, me having all these 5 million degrees, 
it get, it provides a level of privilege too. Yeah. And so, um, and a privilege that it wants, that is supposed to be extended to me, but not to my organization or to my community. So, um, which is not the way that we work around here. And so it's very interesting that I find that um, people um, either seek work or do research or get degrees or whatever it is, advocacy, in whatever way they seek to get deeper involved because they want to help more. And what happens is that um, as these opportunities come your way, um, you are, you know, subtly encouraged you know, not so subtly, I should say, to basically leave behind the activist part of you, to kind of leave that behind and yeah. kind of become more palatable, you know, and, and address these things that are less controversial, even though those needs still exist. So you're supposed to basically feel like, okay, um, if I'm if I'm quiet and uh, or if I don't make a noise around this or that, then you'll still invite me to things and I'll still be okay. Meanwhile, my community is still, in, you know, in shambles and struggling. Mm -hmm. And so, I find it very interesting that, um, you know, um, I use the, you know, the degree hat, professor hat, whatever to get in the door. But then when I come, I, I bring my people with me <laughs> and folks don't like that um, because they people do want to put you in in a particular box. Either you're on the right side of things or you're not. And um, a lot of people say that they want to hear what you know, autistic uh, individuals think and what, you know, they say they want to hear what parents think and they say that, but they really don't actually. A lot of things, people have already, think they have a lot of things figured out and that we all just need to fall in line. And that's, that isn't the way it works for most families, you know, and most individuals. When more, when autistic people, be, be they children or adults, start understanding themselves you know, and um, being true to themselves and uh, giving themselves what they need, the quality of life improves. When parents understand their children better and can um, work with their children in a way that, you know, doesn't, you know, cause harm, quality yeah. of life also comes, becomes better. And so it, you know, often I feel like parents are gaslit in a different way, but almost as much as we are in terms of all of us know nothing and we're just supposed to follow whatever person A, B or C that supposedly the expert says or does about autism. And if you disagree, you're just a disgruntled, you know, angry, um, you know, person, you know, fringe, you know, individual. Except if you're mentally, because mentally is what? I was just about to say, <laughs> I had been told multiple times that I should be in things more. So I, I think that that probably does still hold to the white, I'm supposed to be more active. <laughs> mm -hmm. The thing is, you're just as pissy as the rest of us. I am more pissy. I, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I drop the swear words like the sailor I was. I know. <laughs> I and get I think that's, that's, nasty. And I think that's something people miss. Like communities, oh, there's always going to be new luminaries coming up. There's always going to be, you know, it's not about being burnt out, but like when, when um, Osmond was saying it's not healthy, what we do, it's true because we've been hurt. We've been doxxed. We've been, um, We've been plagiarized. We've had a, a lot of really harmful things um, happen to us, not just professionally, but also personally. Um, and we're in this because we care, but we, we realize that this isn't healthy. You know, it's like the person who works in the coal mine, you know, you know, you might, <laughs> you know, you're going to have yeah. a short lifespan as a result of what you're doing. Um, it's not helpful for you. It's altruistic, but it is it, it is not, it, it's dangerous. And we, everyone's going to be green. Like when you said you didn't know anything about disability justice, I didn't know a freak. I was disabled and didn't know anything about disability. <laughs> everyone's going to be ignorant and everyone's going to have to learn. And we're, everyone's willing to let people learn. The problem is, is that people learn a little bit and they think they are entitled to everyone else, you know, to, to run things or to do things in the way that they, they believe they should be done. Um, or, you know, just, there's just, it, you know, I think people lose their way. People lose the sense of, of, okay, this should be, we're all, we all should be open to growing. This should be collaborative. This should be about moving us forward horizontally and not about um, anyone's individual platform. And I think that's, that gets lost. And I think that it's not so much that, you know, I don't expect a parent like, you know, to know a thing they're going to get late. Their kid gets diagnosed. You're getting a hundred day kit, you know, which fortunately yeah. is a lot better than the one I was given when my children <laughs> were diagnosed um, because autistic people have, you know, you know, helped to revise it. But at any rate, Wait, we're not Marika. expecting. 
Yeah. You were given a hundred day kit when your kids were diagnosed. Oh, you weren't even given that. No. <laughs> I wasn't. I was like, you I'm like wait, this happened to you. <laughs> Yeah, because well, that didn't happen to me. I got told uh, my kid will never potty train that um, I needed to get ABA and all the therapies and then was sit on my way. I wasn't even given like a list of people to go to turn to at that wow. point. I was just sit. Wow. I see, I see a lot of people. That's horrible. Cassiana remembers talking me out of chelation. That's how long ago Tyler was. Like, yep. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, I remember all that. The gluten free, casein free, soy free, deliciousness you know, free. Yeah, and the, oh, the hyperbaric chambers and the um, what honest, was the time that me out of all of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were just so many things that um, I, I don't know. They're just you know all the recovery efforts and diets and things that people were oh. doing off label medications that they were giving to their children. You know, like vitamins. And, Oh my gosh. Yes. It was just, you know, so I got super people, lucky. Yeah. And the snake oil salesmen are real. They're out there. So I think yeah. the issue is less that parents um, don't know, cause they're not going to know you're going to learn on the job like anything else. Um, but I think that um, the lack of willingness, I, I feel like our community parents don't know, but they think they know. And a lot of autistic people um, are bringing the lens that they have, the privilege they have in other communities into the, into autism. And that doesn't work for those of us who are multiply marginalized because don't get me wrong, a person can have privilege. So let's say, you know, there's all types of privilege. There's speaking privilege, there's educational privileges, there's racial privilege, heteronormative privilege. So I'm not saying that person A, you know, advocate that's, you know, been in the community for two years or whatever, who is white and queer they, they, and, and, you know, and autistic, they've got marginalizations. But their life, everything about the way, everything about the, their life is going to be quite different than it is mine or Cassiana's or, or, or Oswin's or everything about it is going to be. And I don't think that people are, are cognizant of that. There's certain things that they want to say or do, and they don't seem to care how it um, erases um, us and our families and the community members that are like us. I mean, I, I'm listening to you. I'm going to get slightly emotional for a moment, but I think about how I entered into my autism diagnosis mm. and everyone in on the board knows how that happened. I don't think most of the audience does, um, but uh, I got diagnosed through court ordered evaluation when they were trying to take my kids away. Oh. Like how else do I enter into the autism community, but having to fight for my right to parent like that is a very, very different position to start out in than realizing it through your graduate studies. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I, I mean, I understand that, you know, I tell a story sometimes <laughs> about how my family and I were literally honored at a national gala as adoptive family of the year. And then the following year, um, because I had, you know, publicly disclosed my, uh, my diagnosis, the following year we were embroiled in a years long custody battle for those same children mm-hmm. because we had I uh, remember. We, children with such quote unquote high needs would not be, or were not capable of being cared for by a disabled parent, you know, and, yeah. um, and according to them. And I mean, there's still, there's 35 states in the unit and states and territories in the United States where disability can be used as grounds for removal of uh, loss of custody. In 10 of those states, that's in the absence of abuse or neglect just because of disability period. Yeah. So you piss off the wrong spouse, the wrong partner, the wrong parent, um, you know, um, grandparent or what have you, and your children, you know, the likelihood that your children can be taken from you is very high. And I think that's something that people don't understand that um, how, you know, that when we're doing this stuff, we, it's because we don't want another parent to ever go through this ever again, another family to go through this, another person to go through this ever, ever again. It's not because um, it's fun. It's not because it pays well. I think this is the first year since FBM has been incorporated that we've had, that, that we've broken up um, four into five digits for our budget, our, 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 our revenue. Yeah. You know, in all, we, we I'm finally to be paid this year. I'm really excited. I'm not being paid much this year. I am being paid a little this year and it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like maybe. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So in talking about all of this, um, because I know people really want to know more about FDM, we've had yes. other questions too. So um, maybe first, so how does, how does everything that you were just talking about with 
you know, the challenges that you've all experienced firsthand and the marginalizations and the exploit exploitative nature of things, how does that um, play out with the initiatives that FDM focuses on? Okay, before uh, anybody answers, I wanted to just say that um, the reason our initiatives exist, there's, there's a statement that Cassiana says that I would love to, you know, to kind of, if you could kind of share about kind of like, what if, the what if, like kind of why we exist and why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, I can do that. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the autistic community right now, um, the whole thing is we'll put your kid back together. But FDM says, what if we never broke autistic kids in the first place? Yeah. Which should not I be love. mind blowing. And yet here we are. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of the angle from which we approach our initiatives is what if we don't break autistic kids in the first place? And then like, that's how we started. And now we are getting, or we're doing more now that um, to help on the other end of things too. But like that first basis of like creating something that we can, that can help people, autistic kids not be, not be put through what they're put through. Like, mm -hmm. um, like three, like three quarters of our board are parents. Mm -hmm. uh, mentally has the oldest child at what, 19, 20 now? He's 24. Oh no, I'm so <laughs> wrong with the age. That's all right. I, um, you see those genes that mentally has? <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing. Would you? Would you, Would anybody in here know that mentally has kid over older than four? <laughs> uh, twenty four. Daniel just turned eighteen this past weekend. Uh, my oldest. Um, we know what happens to our kids. We know. We know what's happening. What's happening to autistic kids across the US and then the globe as well, because mm -hmm. it's not like we just focus on the US. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. There's no reason it has to be that way. None. Uh, but then a couple of years ago, we, we started looking for funding for things for the rest of us too, because the framework that we developed was never meant to be just for kids. Mm -hmm. It's meant to support anyone in anything, anywhere they go. Here, here's how you know to design how to accommodate a person. <laughs> like, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we get people to help... Uh, how do we give this information so that people can advocate for themselves so they can do all these things? And so like that then goes into the other things we're doing, like uh, Marina K can speak to what we're doing with the healthcare. We, uh, I believe sometime this week, Next for Autism is releasing who they gave money to and they gave money to us to do domestic violence um, project to look for red flags with autistic people because we're all domestic abuse survivors. Every one of us, which, um... I kind of feel like society should be embarrassed about that. Like, yeah, parents, I'm judging you for that. Um, professionals, I'm judging you for that. That's y'all. That's not us. That's y'all. Like um, the fact that we like we are set up to be mm -hmm. abused. Yep. society sets us up to be abused and then the autism service provision continues to like push that push those standards and even younger and younger age mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's no escaping abuse when you become an autistic adult so tell us a little more about the things that cause this <laughs> like t tell tell those who are watching specifically what things are contributing to these outcomes? So I'm going to jump in because this is hard for all of us to talk about. And I think because my camera's off, I can talk about it a little more, more freely because <laughs> y'all can't see my expression right now. Yeah. Um, but thank you. Yes. Unfortunately. Um, so first of all, there is the 
um, so the societal view of autism to begin with, the, the limited resources sets everyone up for, you know, a, a false scarcity that shouldn't be there. Um, in, in, you know, and then there's the autism industrial complex where they're, they know, often autism is big business. It's profitable. It's a lot, it's profitable to have multiple, you know, various services and to scare parents to pay for even more beyond what the insurance will, is providing, beyond what the school district is providing. Um, there is the lack of education that parents are given. Like when I mentioned that parents are gaslit, parents are gaslit. The tip, a parent may not share their child's neurology, but they know, okay, I don't really understand why my kid does thing, this thing or this thing, but that thing brings my child joy. Um, it's not hurting anybody. It's kind of weird. But then the professionals come in and say, no, you're a bad parent. You're for allowing them to do this. You've got to stop this. You've got to nip this in the bud. You have to make them do this. You have to make them do that. You know, so your natural parental instinct, which again, you may not understand why, because it's not your neurology, but you know that this calms your child down or you know this is their way of expressing something. You are told to ignore that in favor of, of you know, doing something else. And I don't know if any of you have ever Googled that. Um, there's this, this video where it talks about... Um, parents, um, it, there's parents and babies, and these are typical babies, typically developing non-autistic babies, um, or at least believed to be, um, where the parent, it's like in a, where the child is doing something and trying to get the parent's attention, and the parent is pretending not to notice the child's there at all. So this isn't like a situation where it's parallel play, where this is a situation where the child is used to joint attention and joint interaction, and the, and the parent's not making a mean face or being rude or yelling or screaming. They're just kind of blank, just kind of you know, checked out, like, you know, planned ignoring. And the distress that you see um, on the, these children's faces and the way that it impacts them. And there's also some research that has taken, um, you know, that's looked at their heart rate and all of these other things and how much, how, how much trauma that caused in just that, that few moments. And then right the after- cortisol levels just go through yes. the roof. And yes, yes. And it takes a long time to regulate. And this is just for something that was done momentarily. Imagine this is what parents are told to do to their children all the time, mm -hmm. all day, yeah. every day, seven days a week until they get better, which may better meaning non-autistic, which they'll never get. That's right. so that's disturbing for the parent. That's disturbing for the child. It destroys the bond. It um, allows, it doesn't allow you to see the child that the beautiful child that's right in front of you. Instead, you see this broken human being that you have to fix. Um, you spend your money um, on things that, so instead of your child having a life, 75% um, of um, special needs, you know, or disabled um, school age youth have no activities that they do out this is before the pandemic, I, the number's probably higher now outside of therapies. So outside of OT, PT, speech therapy or ABA, they do literally nothing. They don't do um, extracurricular clubs. They don't do art. They don't do go have fun and just, they, do, they don't do anything because their parents don't have any time because they're told to spend their life <laughs> or money because they're told to spend it all, you know, get a second mortgage on your house to pay for this, this person or this special diet. The child is told the words that are you're diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. It, the, the name itself is stigmatizing. Um, when you look at the diagnostic criteria and the way that it's worded, there's a, a document um, that I, I hand out to people sometimes. I, I based it off of, there's a woman named Brenda Rothman who used to uh, write uh, Mama Be Good has an autistic teen. And um, she broke down the DSM-4 and then parts of five, the, like the terminology. And I, I highlighted like the, the areas where it's using stigmatizing language versus objective. Um, so the child is told that there's something wrong with you, not different, but wrong, mm. um, and is shown by the world that something is wrong with you and, and, is, and becomes self-conscious because of that. Um, so there's all those factors. Then there's the factor that the um, you know, early intervention services um, are variable from, state, from location to location in terms of their quality, in terms of also the quantity. Um, and the, you have an individualized service fam uh, right. family plan but after that, by the time your child turns three and you're in the, the school district, this is an unfunded mandate, you know, for um, the IDEA. So a lot of schools basically, you know, if you're not going to fight and be that parent, and even if you are, <laughs> <laughs> then um, it's not likely to, you're not likely to get the services that you need. Um, most, there's, there's minimal, edu you know, most general education um, teachers have minimal understanding of how to um, uh, properly address the needs of autistic youth. Um, AAC, um, Technology and understanding is 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 eons behind what it should be, if at all. Um, students have segregated education um, a, a great deal of the time. Um, that's in multiple levels. Aren't given um, extended um, you know extended um, end of year um, services for financial reasons. Um, wait lists for services are are years long. 
Um, it, it's just, I mean, there's just, it's just a huge amount of things that, um, you know, that create these problems. And that's not even talking about things like other factors that family might have, like other children and those needs or educational attainment or financial difficulties or being in an area where maybe, you know, geographically there are limited services or, um, you know, insurance caps that only say X amount of, of, you know, occupational therapy sessions this year, no matter how many your child needs, um, or living in a, a you know, in, being in a school district where you're not going to get where, you know, the services where they own, they, they have, you know, poorly integrated, um, you know, s- services and your child's not mainstreamed. Like these are, these are just this, that's just these baseline things. I haven't talked about crime rate. I haven't talked about health. I haven't talked about any of that <laughs> yet. Just those basic things that I've shared set a child up for failure. There's a reason why the life expectancy of autistic people is in the 30s. And so because of, you know, not just suicide, but also accidents, um, the poor health outcomes that we have, the lower um, home homeownership and, um, you know, chronic poverty and, you know, you know, uh, instable, you know, home, you know, all of that, you know, being constantly homeless or at risk of homelessness. Okay. Christiana? And um, more directly, more focused and more, um, I will directly say the thing that people don't want to hear, um, specifically pointing to domestic violence. Um, People break us down 40 hours a week with do this gummy bear, do this gummy bear or whatever your gummy bear is. They systemically make us people pleasers and tell us if we don't do exactly what they want us to do, bad things will happen to us or good things won't happen to us. And it's entirely our fault. Um, So yeah, you know, they groom us. They set us up for abuse. They yeah, tell so us why wouldn't, yeah, an abuser, um, why wouldn't um, an abuser? They wouldn't set us up for it. They systemically set us up for it. They could not write a more perfect system for it if they tried. So okay. of course we experience domestic violence because that is what the that is the track the world puts us on. We don't uh, even recognize that we're being abused when we are because we've mm-hmm. been told our whole lives, no, you 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 only get when you say what we expected you to say, not what you want to say or not what you want to say, when you move the way we want you to move or request something the way we want you to request, then you get attention, then you get love, then you get praise, then you can play with the toy that you want or eat the food that you want or be, or someone will look at you or acknowledge you. So why wouldn't you spend your life d- downgrading your needs and trying to meet that of others, even if that of others is harmful? Um, and so you don't recognize, not only do you not recognize physical abuse because you, know, you might've been told to stop stimming or you might have all of these you know, other things there's a lot of you know really regressive you know what I mean treatments that you know that involve physical coercion but so let's let's take about that you, you know physical abuse you may not recognize emotional and sexual abuse you certainly don't recognize when that's you know when you're being taken advantage of when you're being manipulated or 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 lied to you are a perfect the, the perfect prey for that partner that wants to put that, that wants to beat somebody you are the perfect prey for that person who wants someone to smuggle drugs across the country you are that perfect prey for someone who wants uh, you know to get you t- into sex work you're a even, perfect friend even getting even smaller than that like uh Cassiana, can i tell the story that involves you when you Which were at one? utd what when you were at utd um a few years ago and you during the it was an yeah. april thing um like before the pandemic uh, and you came and stayed at my place probably yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> like narrow it down for um yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, Cassiana was giving a talk at UTD, uh, U- University of Texas at Dallas, which is down the street from me. And afterwards, we came up and and people or we're having the Q&A and this dude comes up and he is being the grossest thing possible. <laughs> and this is one of those ones I wiped from my mind. Probably. <laughs> like star wipe. <laughs> but Cassiana was couldn't escape it because not allowed to because training this guy being just really really gross and in a way that was like he he was talking about some form of uh oh was this like yeah. my anime persona self-insert guy yeah yes yes okay, this dude. Yeah. and Cassiana starts giving me eye contact I don't know if you've ever met if you've <laughs> never met Cassiana you will not understand. Uh, Cassiana giving you eye contact is like, save me right now because it's the only time that Faye gives eye contact. (laughs) And I'm like, I need to get you out of the situation. (laughs) 
And we, and I was able to insert myself because I didn't have ABA and I can say, oh, hey, we need to get going to my kid's birthday party, which was not immediately following that. We were just escaping. But that low level of not even something huge and terrible and just a guy being gross and not being able to escape from that. Which is already an issue, you know, without any of this conditioning happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So but, like Cassiana knew that they needed to get out of that situation and couldn't. Yeah. Like that's bad. That will always be bad. <laughs> yeah. Because what if that person ends up being something even worse? You know, and Amy Sequencia has some writing where she talks about um, how about the fact, you know, so people talk about our lack of empathy, you know, which is hilarious because Mm -hmm. autistic people, if anything, are hyper (laughs) empathetic, you know, too empathetic, you know, to a fault. Um, And she talks about how, you know, her parents who were very loving, um, you know, but were, you know, fooled or were, you know, manipulated like a lot of parents are. And they um, put her in some, in various programs, including residential programs when she quote unquote wasn't progressing um, that were harmful, but very expensive and supposed to be the best place for her. And so she talks about how she felt bad even for the, so there were, there were providers and there, you know, all these providers, you know, there's like, you know, various levels of workers. So there's the management and there's the people who, you know, do the daily frontline tasks and so on. And, you know, there's a lot of turnover in these, um, you know, in these types of jobs, they're, they're not, they don't pay very well. They also aren't very selective on the people that they bring in. So, you know, mm-hmm. these are typically not, you know, people who just have a heart for working for children. These are people who need a job. Yeah. And so she talks about how even the people who were, who would mistreat her, like pinch her when, because she couldn't cry out to say anything or fondle her or what have you. She also felt like there was, she felt sorry for them. Like she felt like something was wrong with them and she, you know, felt bad for these abusers or that some of the people who were, you know, like educational programs that didn't understand her cognitive ability and were teaching her things that were far below her level. She know they knew that they meant well in their heart. They cared about children. They cared about disabled people. And so even though she, what they were doing was harmful, she felt bad for them. Like she had empathy for them. So there's so many times when people realize this shouldn't be happening, but A, who's going to believe you, the autistic child or adult? And B, do you really feel that you have that autonomy to be able to go against this person and state that they've done something that hurts you? And you know, when no one believes things that, no one believes you when you say the lights hurt you or this clock hurts you or this t-shirt or these socks hurt you, why would they believe you when you're saying something that sounds even more egregious? Um, Would you all talk a little bit about because we so we have a question about FDM um, and your position on ABA, which we'll get to right after this. But before we do that, can you talk a little bit about how, um, like, there are some parents, especially parents of color, like this has been more of a conversation recently, who feel coerced into doing these sorts of things, um, you know may be threatened by child protective services if they aren't, you know, doing things that the people in position of power think they should be doing, or if, you know, their child isn't, Osmond, I'm going to let you go because I know (laughs) you're signaling to me. Go ahead. So personal experience here. Uh, As I said, my kids were nearly taken away because of court order evaluation. They also forced ABA on us. We didn't have a choice. Like it was a term of our treatment plan. (laughs) It's real. It happens. It happened to us. It happened to my child. Um, I'm going to tell somebody to defer to not have their kids taken away. That's survival. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's more common than people think. So I think people don't recognize, you know, a lot of people um, that there you go on, they're like, ABA is abuse. Yes, all ABA. Don't do that. I'm thinking it's not that simple. Are you a parent? Because last I checked, some of us don't really have a whole lot of options. 
um, let's say a person, we now look, we now are in a circumstance where but Medicaid in all 50 states pays for ABA. It's considered the quote unquote evidence based or the gold standard. We know that that's not necessarily the case and there's data to back that up. But you, a person lives here in this school district or in this you know, region where there's X amount of clinics or providers, you don't really have the luxury of saying, well, I read about this obscure, you know, cool educational program that's in Brussels and I want to implement it for my child. It's not gonna work like that. You are, um, if you are not seen as, if you're seen as being um, hostile um, to the, the people who are involved with your child's IEP or the providers, um, these are, remember, these are all um, mandatory reporters. Medical neglect, it is not, it, it's very easy for someone to pick up the phone or, to, or, or open up their computer and type up a few things and now you're under investigation. Um, and people aren't going to understand, understand when they come to your house if you have holes in the walls because your autistic child sometimes gets frustrated and hits things. Or if you have a mattress on the floor because they, you know, maybe they fall down, they are scared of heights. They don't, you, you know, they're not going to understand why you don't have um, X amount of fresh fruits, vegetables, and grains in your refrigerator and pantry because your child only eats these three things. You know, so I think that people don't understand that. And they also don't understand the reality of a lot of communities of color is that we've had, we've, you know, colonialism and just life has created a circumstance where we've had to impose things upon ourselves and our children that we hate just to stay alive, just to survive. So ABA is far from the worst of it. It's emotionally abusive, it's coercive, but if you if you are in a situation where you have to tell your children don't answer the door no matter what, um, because of the fact that you don't want anyone to know they're home alone, you know, or you have to tell them, or you know, or, where you, or you have to have the talk with them when they when they become preteens, so because they're getting bigger now and you want them to be safe and you know survive interactions with the police um or when you have to tell your children to wear things without pockets when they go to certain stores so that no one will accuse them of stealing you know um or you have to build in 30 to 40 minutes extra for every single plane ride because their hair is going to set off the the alarm and you're gonna have to be ser secretly searched when all of these things are in your life already um you're accustomed to having to do things that you don't like um, that you have to do, or you feel like you have to do because you don't have any other alternatives. You know, most of the political alternatives that we have, um, the, you know, that we have to follow are not things that we're really enamored with, but it's kind of like you take the lesser of two evils. And that's what a lot of people do. When, you if know, they don't have anything else, if that's what's around, if that's what's offered, if you don't see any other alternatives, what are you going to do? I, so, yeah, go ahead. ABA is abusive, but um, if, your child can be with you and you can undo the damage because you know that they are a lot better off than if they're with some other family that is fully whole hog into it because they got taken away. And there's a lot of things that your kids of color are going through that you can help them through. If you are a family of color that they can't, that a white family, and we all know that a lot of foster families are white, that they are not going to help them through. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, I hate that ABA is a thing. I hate it every single, with every single fiber of my being. There's a lot of ick, 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 ick with realities. Um, I want to see, I want to see it be a not thing. I also am aware that there's a lot of other things we need to be simultaneously dealing with um, for that to be safe for, you know, little black autistic kids. Like, I hate this. I hate this reality so much. Um, I should say, if you're in a position like me, I mean, I've got three autistic kids, two are still at home. If you are a white middle class, staying home with your kids, homeschooling, have good insurance, middle, you know, mom, parent, we are not the people that Oswin and Mornike and Tassiana are talking about. And I have been seeing people oh, yeah, like no, you can't, talking get, about it you don't get to do aba yeah you I don't have seeing, an excuse <laughs> i've been seeing the parents like me using the nuanced conversation as the excuse for their aba mm -hmm, and i yeah. think it's very important for us to say that the nuanced aba conversation is not for me it is not for us the nuanced conversation is for the people that deserve nuance and it's very important that that conversation gets had too, because the nuanced conversation is not for the people. It's not for me. You know, I have 
every two to three years since my kids were my oldest that's now 18 was three years old every two to three years have cps in our home at least to investigate something that is my existence right that's terrible um now i've done disability justice long enough that i know how to show them that my kids are well taken care of without doing the other stuff but there's also another no one dynamic. should have my level of oh, sorry. no one sorry no one should have to have my level of knowledge to ignore to be able to do that mm-hmm. like that uh, but that is reality that is always that it that is reality for the majority of my community i'm pretty sure the majority of Morana case community that sometimes you have to go along with what the system says right And there's a gender piece to this too, um, because there are, um, you know, you know, thinking about some some white moms, right, or um, people who are assigned female at birth. There are a lot of times where, because we know that, you know, um, autistic children, you know, tend to have neurodivergent families. So the mother may not be autistic, but she might be neurodivergent in some other way, kind of quirky, maybe ADHD, some anxiety, or what have you, or maybe not. Maybe she's neurotypical, but we know that. There are a lot of times where there's strife in the home. And if you um, aren't, if, if you don't toe the line with what you've been told or what you, what's been encouraged by someone else, you find yourself at risk um, as well. So if you have, you know, if, who has the bigger power, power dynamic in the relationship or in society? Is it you or is it another, you know, is it another party from more privileged gender? You know, whether you're, you know, together or whether you're separated, um, how does that play into things? Because there are circumstances like that as well, where people have been said, it's like, oh, well, the mom is just babying him or her or them. The mom won't do this, this and the other. The mom is the problem. You mm-hmm. know, when he's with me, he does this, this and the other. Yes, because he's scared of you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, you know, that's not that meaning you have better discipline. It means that she has a, a closer relationship with her child and maybe the child feels more free to be their actual selves. And so there's that dynamic that is, you know, occurs as well, where people are fearful of, you know, other, of custody issues, maybe not related to race, but because of other, you know, discriminatory factors, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. I have heard a lot of parents talk about um, being blamed or even they are called non-compliant at times if, you know, certain therapists think that they aren't like doing everything that they're supposed to. Um, so we, I mean, it's a problem that therapists think they should get to control, um, a family's whole life. Like that is a problem. And every single therapist needs to think why they think they have that. Like, this is very much an issue of the entire system is broken. We are just aware that the system is broken and that, people have to live in it and that it's a ra- a lot of things are a racism problem and a kiriarchy problem. Um, we're yeah. still anti ABA. We are just more anti feeding kids into a series in, more into a severely bigoted system. Right. I, I feel and like I that's want- accurate. Yeah. yeah I like, I, I, yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure that people are asking that because I've been speaking a lot to BCBAs and I think that people need to realize that me doing that is bringing this same message to them it's not like I'm telling them how to do ABA better that's impossible there's (laughs) no such thing as good ABA (laughs) um like so like I get I'm I'm relatively certain that's where that question is coming from if I'm like yeah uh, one, question, and honest. <laughs> one question said, uh, what is the thinking behind reversing the foundation's position on ABA? Was this decision made in community with the wider autistic community? And then Mel has asked, um, what kinds of harm reduction would you recommend to people forced into ABA or with kids exposed to behaviorist practices at school? We haven't reversed our decision on ABA. Never. And we our, never will. our stance is that that field has grown exponentially large. Like half of the new, half of RBTs that were in practice last year were new RBTs last year. And there were 110,000 RBTs last year. ABA is not going away. And if we can't start to face that reality and face what, what is going to happen because of what Marina Kay is saying with the 50, now all 50 states have Medicaid mm-hmm. coverage, which means that all of our families that 
don't access the internet. Don't go onto these groups. Right. Don't do anything within the autistic community, the autism community, the neurodiversity community, the ABA community are going to be getting those services. Yes, absolutely. And, and at least cannot, before, at least before keep... it was an income thing where, okay, well, if you don't have this income or this insurance, you don't get it. So at least we, there was, a, there was at one point, there was the consolation that, um, you know, children who are lower income, you know, aren't being subjected to this, <laughs> but you know, that, right, that's not reality anymore. No, no. It, is, it is absolutely not the reality. And I think that's what people don't understand. Like we live in the real world. Yeah. Um, I think, um, se- I, I, it, help me if I'm wrong, I think approximately 70 to 75% of, of current BCBAs and BCBADs were um, certified in the last five years. Yes, and yeah. that's yes. their research. That's yes, their information that's, from that's coming out. Mm-hmm. That's not out. That's not hostile research. That's internal material. I think people mm-hmm. don't realize that we're trying to think strategically. We're not going to. We're not going to sit here and, and um, throw eggs at the door and think that that's going to break. You know, break the building down. What we have seen is the things that we have said and stated have a lot of people who are inside the field has caused. It has caused them to do a lot of reflection. It has caused them to raise a lot of questions. It has caused them to start looking at working with other, um, you know, partnering with other um, disciplines and um, bringing in other, you know, innovative methods. It has caused a lot of them, frankly, to, I I won't, you know, to create, to, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, so I won't mention any places, but to commit insurance fraud. (laughs) Because they know that if you call it ABA, you can bill it as ABA. But when they start thinking, you know, I want to bring in more developmental practices here, or I want to take, you know, bring in more um, technology in AAC. I want to bring in some elements that I think are helpful, that are more appropriate, socially appropriate for, you know, and that build more autonomy. Um, But I'm licensed as this, you know, if, if I don't build this, then the kid doesn't get services. Like, you know, there's a lot of people doing things from the inside to try to, you know, make change um, because they're becoming aware. And Relentless, th- go ahead. Yeah, go. Uh, and I think that a, a lot of what people may be missing with this is we're not a policy organization. We're not mm-hmm. ASAN, we're not AWN. We do practice. Yeah. Like we yep. are trying to change things right now. And if somebody has model legislation for getting ABA reversed, please start working on that and start spreading that because we all need that. But Mm -hmm. that's not what our organization does. Frankly, I don't have the stomach for that. There, especially in the state of Texas where you're doing a rush for like five months every two years and don't sleep because I tried that this last session to try and not get ABA. We certainly did and it failed. And it failed. Like we all we were trying to do was get the state of Texas to study to see if it was actually as effective as they're claiming it is. Because I mean, the the research that the ABA lobby uses to to justify ABA being paid is from 1998. From 1998, we're not a policy organization. And you know what we're doing? I want you all to. So these are the words I want you to. We are confronting them with the unfortunate reality that's not unfortunate we're, we're rubbing in their face the undeniable reality that's the word i mean that we're people they can't ignore it when we're in front of them telling them things you're welcome because then they have to change things or else they have to look oh us in the face and say actually you're not people those are their choices and i get and it's working for, i get yeah. that it's not for everyone and that everyone can't do it i get that I'm not I can't sell. do it a lot of the time. <laughs> like, I'm not going to, I'm definitely not going to ask Cassiana to stand up in front of a group of BCBAs. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, the masochistic but, BCBAs. <laughs> uh, but like, we're not, one, we're not going to change all of them. A lot of BCBAs core values are just suck. Mm-hmm. But there are people that got into that field because it was what people told them would help autistic would help people. children. They're there to help mm-hmm. children. Ultimately, right. that's what they think they're doing. You know, so if you can show them that you're not helping children, that there's other ways that you would then be able to help children. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to stop hurting children. 
And a lot of them have. They've moved into other positions in school districts, in clinics, in training, and so forth, um, not direct care. And they're and they're advocating for change. Even though, again, I think that you know our our organization is clear on the fact that I know there are people who feel like, uh, and I respect their opinions. There's people who feel like you can. They're looking at some of the natural developmental behavioral interventions, and so there's people who think that you can make put a more trauma informed lens. And I think that the, just the basis of ABA is such to where you aren't, it isn't something that can be reformed. I mean, you know, I appreciate people's efforts, but you can make something like, for example, you can make something less problematic doesn't mean it's no longer problematic. But what we're about here is um, looking at the reality. Um, it's not, you know, clicking our heels three times and wishing is not making it go away. So what can we do for our community in terms of our um, FDM's approach with education and engagement, in terms of harm reduction, in terms of health care? We're doing practical things to to change lives. Like when we finish this call today, um, I'm going. We're part, we partnered for over a year now um, with a with um, the National Disability Rights Network and with John Hopkins University Disability Center, um, and we have um, worked. We've um, done some work on like decoding and collecting the stories of. Um, disabled people of color and you know, people with intellectual disabilities and providers and looking at things that um, have been barriers to healthcare and looking at strategies and resources. And we're now um, working on a new project called Sunstorm Stories that will uplift the stories of people with um, developmental disabilities, including autism and other health conditions and um, circumstances they've faced and resources that have been helpful. Um, we are going to, we are funding that, pro that, that and um, each of those individuals is gonna be documentary style and we're gonna be um, filming it and um, airing it in the month of June. And so these are the type of things that we're doing, you know, like and we just finished a pilot program um, where we looked at developing social engagement in, in a non-stigmatizing skill-based um, mm -hmm. program in Massachusetts with typical, with, you know, non-autistic and autistic children. And now we're looking into expanding that program into another state. I mean, there, and, and another country even, you know, we're doing applied things like we, 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 we know the big change won't come till after we're dead, but we're, we're going to make every small change that we can while we're all here. Yeah. Um, it's so necessary. And again, this is not easy work at all. Um, and I want to point out too, that a couple of people were also saying that like ABA is also in most public schools now. Um, and it's not just even explicit ABA. I mean, these types of practices are embedded in all of education on some level, you know, a lot of speech yeah. therapy, you know, so, so it's, it's so much bigger even than just, um, ABA specifically. And like, I feel like that's what you're all trying to get to the root of is like, mm -hmm. this isn't like, oh, just make it look nicer or more trauma informed or something. It's like the premise of the it's question wrong. that you're starting with is wrong. So our recreation program was super cool because it was absolutely not ABA. It's just, here's y'all have some things in common, go make friends. And um, but here have all these social supports and understand yep. that there's diversity in the way that like yep. teaching all the kids diversity in the mm -hmm. ways that people react and show their emotions. Yeah. And yeah. it no ABA, none, none, none. Like if you have had, wasn't it that the um, persons oh. who, the facilitators who had experience with autism, like, nope, you're bad at this. You can't. Uh, the people that were able to, uh, to run the program best were the uh, high schoolers from that had never worked with autistic kids before and not the RBT mm -hmm. type people right. that had worked with the autistic kids before. Which is fascinating. Um, and from these studies, so um, we told you this. Yeah. And what we saw was that there was an increase in back to forth interaction with mm -hmm. initiating things just by baseline. Hey, there's a diversity mm -hmm. of ways that we can we can react to things. Here's all these supports in place so that you know how to navigate your environment. And hey, here's a, br a break place for you to go calm down. Yeah. I really it's like that. Um, super program. simple, but we saw this growth in six weeks, like exponential growth in all areas that we measured, which were problem solving, self-advocacy, initiating, and, um, and turn-taking. And the last two, we didn't give any explicit instruction on. 
it naturally occurred. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, I mean, research, real, you know, scientific research shows that that's the best way that our nervous systems learn is not by being prompted and forced into mm-hmm. doing things, but by, you know, natural exploration and acceptance. Feeling safe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it's safety. Yeah. Acceptance yeah. is safety. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about so first of all, this, this, um, I don't know, is it called a program? This, this, uh, oh, this, you and part of do with access that there aren't things like this available widely. And a big reason for that, that we've already mentioned, um, a little bit earlier is, you know, there's this autism industrial complex. Um, and for anyone watching, we just had uh, uh, Dr. Alicia Broderick explain the whole thing um, a couple weeks ago, so you can look for that. Um, but so autistic people have been commodified. Um, like you said, there's a lot of basis in racism. There's a basis in a- ableism, but capitalism also is a huge piece of this because there are powerful lobbyist groups who have um, successfully gotten coverage, you know, for very particular, um, therapies or whatever you want to call them services. And so there's no option for anything else. Like even before, um, I forget specifically what we were talking about, but it was like, 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 Oh, Cassiana, you were talking about how, like a lot of kids don't have any like extracurricular activities. And even for that though, there's like a disability tax because places charge more for, you know, special needs services for, you know, like, let's say a kid wants to do a gymnastics class, for instance, you know, you, you're going to pay more for your kid to be accommodated. Not at my not gym, they're not. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> at my but, gym, they come to my but class. You, that's it. you are the exception. And, but so I want people to understand, like even the community, like, you're right. And not only yes. the higher cost, if that's, if they'll let your kid in, because mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, you know, right. there's plenty of things that you try to enroll your child in and oh, sorry, we don't, we can't accommodate mm-hmm. child right. extra time. Or yes, if you stay the whole time on the whole mm-hmm. four hours next to your kid, you know, no other parent is doing that, but sure you must. Right. I mean, mentally kids are always in new things. So I'm sure they have significant experience with this because I don't have the money to do that. <laughs> But we're always in new things because Andre keeps getting tossed out. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, I know it's true, but still, oh, yeah. But, that's but why. part of what we need here is for you know the community who's talking about this abuse and the problems, and for the parents who are looking for more options. We have to be able to come together because the root problem here is that autistic people have turned into commodities exactly you know, through no choice of our own this yes. is but this is the situation that we have now so it's not just doing the sorts of work that you're all doing but it, it is also we need these other advocacy organizations who can Absolutely. work on this policy change right exactly. so this is like right. Exactly. It's and that's just why not who we are. Like, yes. And I think I that know. confuses people because, you know, our the legacy um, kind of organizations, you know, so ASAN does policy work, you know, AWN does, you know, like, like work with regard to gender justice and, you know, like community support. And we do practical application education and healthcare, you know, like neuroplastic, neuroplastic does a lot of um, yeah. their stories. The yes, stories exactly. are just amazing that come out of neuroplastic. Yeah, um, autistic but, retreats, you know, deals with late diagnosed adults. So everyone has a piece. They're, all of these organizations are different, but we, we all have our own foci. Um, but we need the, the everyday person, too, to be involved and to speak up and to say things about things that they're concerned about in their communities as well. Um, people feel so hopeless sometimes and so helpless. They don't realize how powerful their voice can be. That public comment to a school district or a school board or a local official um, asking um, some you know, provider to take the puzzle piece down and put up an infinity symbol or to use non-stigmatizing language, you know, sending an email to the IACC about priorities that children, you know, for children and adults. 
people have a lot more power than they realize. I think, so when I, obviously at ASAN, like most of what I did there was the policy, but also the community stuff. So like, um, but that was still organizing around systems change advocacy. Well, the problem is that we can advocate for systems change, but if there's not something to replace it with, because it is a system, you can't yeah. remove a system and not have anything in its place because people have come to expect that. And Alicia was talking about that um, yeah. in the other um, webinar. And I really appreciated that she brought that up because like uh, the framework that we developed was a response to if not ABA, then what? Right. Mm-hmm. Which Here's is like the number what? one question asked by mm-hmm. even I've even seen like school administrators ask that like people who are on board with, okay, I understand what you're saying about the current problems, but what do we do instead? Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I get that, like you want a replacement because as much as I know, and the autistic community will say this over and over again, and I'm going to upset some people um you can come sit with me in the angry making corner we have beanbags yay beanbags okay I love beanbags um is no we shouldn't just let autistic kids be um because they're getting a message from everyone else about what they're supposed to not be we have to counter right we have to provide ways for kids to know who they are and what they need and how they can access it. Those are the things that we need to be doing, not just, oh, let your kids develop naturally. Well, because we don't do that with any child, no matter what the neurology, there's no human. The reason why we have a skeletal system is because our body needs structure. You know what I mean? We still develop freely. So we're not saying, you know, I think people, there's a lot of misunderstanding and that I think people saying, we're saying we don't want children to have, you know, coercive, um, you know, manipulative, you know, or compliance-based um, guidance. We're not saying we don't want them to have any type of structure or guidance. There can be flexibility. It can be individualized, but we mm-hmm. think that just like, you know, a non-autistic child wouldn't, you wouldn't say, oh, okay, well, let's just them, let them do whatever they want, run into the street, die. You wouldn't say that. And so we want, but we just want to, it just needs to be affirming and it needs to be something that's, that doesn't dehumanize people. And I think that right, right now, all we've got is a cattle prod. And so that's what everybody uses. It's like, you know, and that's, we don't want a cattle prod. <laughs> Yeah. Like and again, the, still, the sorry. sorry. Uh, we still need things like speech therapy so people can access AAC devices and be able to learn how to use those AAC devices. Because guess what? That is not intuitive. Mm-hmm. If you've right. never used a picture based um, AAC device, that is not intuitive. It can be slightly intuitive depending on which one you pick, depending on the person's learning and motor skills that. It, th- there's going to be one that's more intuitive than the others, which is why you have to go through that whole process. But like that is not an intuitive process. And you're starting it so much later than the actual communication has been going on in the head. Yeah. We still need occupational therapy because we still need to be able to learn how to work with the sensory environment that we're in. We still need to be able to learn executive functioning workarounds. I'm going to say working rounds. We're never going to gain those skills. <laughs> um, we still need people to do those kinds of things to develop like our understanding of what this person needs. Right. So there's always going to be a need for therapists because therapists should, in theory, know how to <laughs> support a person. Right. Which is why we have the course for providers as a separate thing from the course for um, for parents and caregivers. Exactly. I think that's one of the things that's so beautiful about the FDM model. And we probably should you know, talk about it a bit for those who may be unfamiliar um, in more detail because of the fact that it's something that's portable. It can be used by a sibling. It can be used by a parent. It can be used by a teacher, you know, a provider, um, what have you, because like ultimately, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, they're these these professionals all these people none of us are enemies here we all want things to be done we want things better you know for everyone we might have different ways of going about it people might be um you know misguided but i feel like you just summed it up on accident or maybe on yeah yeah none of us are enemies here 
Yes. Yeah. We're exactly. not enemies here. We're not antagonists here. That's literally what makes us different. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like I, I think the problem is that we're seen as antagonists, though, because we. Yes, but we, we have no say choice. Say things out loud. But I mean, like the the approach, because a lot of therapies right now for autism is antagonistic, and that's yes. what makes us different. We are not yes. antagonistic. <laughs> yes, sorry, right yes. Right now, we sound antagonistic because yes. it's against the system. We're we're antagonists against the right. system, not against. Right, you're trying to disrupt. We're antagonists against the system, but Foundations for Divergent Mind is not antagonistic again right. with you know the our, our model's not antagonistic with person's being supported yes and I think that's a mis a misconception that people have about us because they're like Mm -hmm. we're known for being folks who call stuff out but someone has to call it out believe me we wish we didn't have to like I know every time before I have to do something I look to the left look to the right hoping somebody else is going to say something I know I'm not the only one who noticed it but people Mm -hmm. are scared or people are intimidated or they don't feel that they can do it and I'm scared too we're all scared but we're going to do the right thing because no one spoke up for us (laughs) <laughs> you know, and so yeah. um, we, you know, that's how you, you know, you, you get proud by practicing, you know, and I think that so I think people think, okay, well, they're, they're not intimidated, they've gone here, they've, 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 they've stood up to this organizer or this organization, this policy group, this research group, this whatever, but that's by, def- that, that's, that's not we by choice. To. We have mm-hmm. to, to survive and our people need us yeah. to, it's not because we want to, that's not luxury. We would love not to have to do those things, you know, but that's not reality. And so, um, but our heart, you know, our individual, like we, you know, we may look like this big, tough entity, but we're really softies. We want to get in here with these parents and say, get on the floor with your kid and play and giggle. You know, we want to t- tell these providers, you know, kind of don't be so stuffy, have fun with your, you know, with, with your, your clients. We want to tell these teachers, get messy, laugh. You know, we want, there's so much enjoyment that people can get out of life that is being sucked out by yeah. these, you know, ineffective and ableist systems. And, you know, and that's one of the beauties of the, the, the foundations, you know, like looking at people's individual needs and adjusting the environment to, you know, for, you know, for optimal, you know, it, learning and connection. Yeah. Um, someone asked um, how they could find out more about the recreation program in order to try to bring it to their own communities. Okay, so um, we are not ready to post that publicly yet because we are in talks with a major university to try and do research on it. Um, And we want to be able to um, refine it a little bit more before we bring it into public sphere, Um, but it will be coming. It's not, uh, and it will be publicly available. It will not cost anything because um, uh, we are all for democratization, democratization of knowledge, um, as long as we can keep the lights on. <laughs> yeah. So if someone was to subscribe to, like, they were to go to FDM and um, follow, so our website is divergentminds.org, and if they were to sign up for updates or follow our social media, we, you know, this is that's part of our education and engagement programming, and that's something that we will make publicly available. Um, and so, um, but like you said, we, we, one of the reasons why it may take time for us to, re- those are yours, sweetheart. Um, the, yeah, the reason why it takes time for things to be released is because we like to make sure that what we do is evidence informed um, and not, you know, like there's a lot of things that, it, you know, I think about growing up how, you know, people would laugh at, oh, get some hot tea and some lemon and some ginger or put some, you know, um, you know, but now those are things that people have found, okay, these things do provide relief or whatever. So like these things that used to be considered, you know, just mama's remedies or what have you. And so we, we there's things anecdotally the commu- that the um, autistic community has shared that research has later backed up, such as the high rates yeah. of gender diversity or, you know, a m- number of other things, um, you know, with, you know, Ehlers-Danlos and there's just a lot of things. And so we want the same thing because we want, if it's coming from autistic people, we need to be able to, it has to be able to stand and then some, <laughs> because it's going to be, it's going to be put under scrutiny. We, we don't have the luxury of saying, pulling some data from 1998 and saying, everybody believe us. That's not the way it works. We have to work twice as hard to get half. Yeah. So um, what are some practical ways that the community could support you? And um, um, can we actually back up? I really want to make yeah. sure that we, uh, we never actually answered Mel's question on um, oh. 
on the harm reduction, reduction. Um, recommendations. And I, I really want to make sure that we're doing that. It's, um, one, I think it's really important that at home you're doing everything to be anti that anti-behaviorist practice. So believe your kid when they're telling you something. Talk about when they're showing distress, talk about those co-regulation things that you're doing. Talk about um, about recognizing or and help recognize your kid's needs because as long as you have secure attachment with your kid, um, and that is like the, the goal here is secure attachment with your parents so that yeah. you have somebody later on in life that you can refer back to of this is what it was good to, or what was a healthy relationship because there's tons of people that you're going to have un, or your kids are going to have unhealthy relationships with in this system but if you have that healthy attachment at home which means that you are going to be observant of your kid as much as possible that you're going to communicate with them when you're doing something that's different than what they may expect so that they can understand why um, all these things so that they can know that you're not just being authoritarian that you're not just being that you're not just expecting compliance that you are just helping your kid right be authentic authentically themselves so everything you can do to do that is a harm mitigation strategy um, from the behaviors practices that are in school or if you're forced into ABA. Um, and you'll probably end up with BCBAs that will um, drop you from your caseload. So you just keep on finding a new one until you find someone that is okay with you not following those things at home. Um, because I know that BCBAs will do that. Um, but that's not your fault if you are um, forced into that situation. You can just point to the fact that you want your kid to feel safe with you. Yeah. Thank you for But about me. how people can support us, I've got a couple of things. That's, we all probably have a few things. Yes. But here's one thing that I'd say is that, you know, there are, um, there are these different um, memes and things that kind of go around the community makes that said, you know, don't support X, Y, Z organization, support, you know, you know, ABC organization instead. And we are notoriously silly left off that list. And I think, and I think again, we're not, we, you know, our policy is not our work. We're doing things that we, we do practical work. And so um, it's a little, you know, it's slower. It's a little less glamour, you know, glam. And um, we probably don't do the greatest job in PR because we're all, we're a working board. You know what I mean? So we're, you know, hands on deck, all of us, you know, with what we do. And so we don't have you know, we're, you know, doing a lot for a small team, you know, and, and really proud of the things that we've been able to accomplish with the minimal resources that we've had. Um, but, you know, as a 501c3, donations are super helpful for us. Um, if, you know, we'd, we love to, you know, grants or subgrants, you know, are helpful as well. Seed funding, interns, you know, having students or volunteers who can provide um, support, all of these things um, would really help us. Um, we um, would love to, you know, we're, um, you know, we're trying to do, get more into translational research. And we're looking at an intern, for, you know, who will be helping with that. But that's another way that people can help. Um, we're going to start licensing the FDM model um, for, for people to use and to kind of in, in their practices. So similar to, um, you know, how it is, um, it was utilized by, um, you know, Rachel Dorsey and Lauren Play Thrive, you know, but this would be explicitly people doing so just like when, when you license anything else, a franchise or what have you, and it'll be for a minimal cost. It's really more about getting the idea out. It's not about making money, um, but, um, you know, support, you know, people sometimes do birthday, fun, you know, Facebook fundraisers, Amazon fun, you know, um, Amazon smiles, you know, um, you know, Giving Tuesday, um, really, you know, we, you know, program, um, a lot of what we do goes into programs, we don't really have a whole lot of operational support, we just kind of make do, you know, and so um, we just really, you know, that would be something that's important, you know, like we think, you know, sharing, those are kind of some, like, guess, ex direct ways to support us in general. Um, and I know others have other things to share, but I just wanted to mention those. Thank you. Um, I also find, I know that people um, bring us up in diff various uh, autism groups that are autistic people talking to parents. Um, and we've been able to go out to some schools and do, or 
well, we've been able to go up to one school and we're um, setting up to go up to a different school district to um, just do information uh, education. Uh, we, we ran a really, or one school ran a um, diversity um, day to explain about this different disabilities. So I was able to go out to talk to kids second grade and under um, about autism, but I used the FDM framework to be able to talk about it so that these little kids could understand how they could support their peers instead of wow. the normal things that we end up doing. Um, but like those, when you're suggesting um, autistic organizations that can speak to more th than just adult issues that just talk yeah. about autism in general, then we are that, that is the, or we are the organization that um, I feel like should be suggested there because we're not taught, we don't do, again, we don't do policy work. We don't do. And it's important work, but that's just not our focus. Right. 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 Like I, I obviously I want to see that policy work happen. I can't do it. I can do this. I can talk about this. We mm -hmm. can talk about this. Um, uh, we're also getting, uh, we have also went ahead and started to fold in mine, Marina Kay and Cassiana's uh, consulting stuff. So like, if you want to talk about how, or like I'm doing mostly the, the practice side of things, but uh, 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 with therapies, but like um, Marina Kay does quite a bit on racial disparities and all of that. And Kostyan is really, really great at um, sports. Like, I know, but like, I we know. know the importance of, of that. I'm we your jock autistic, the yes. one and only. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the one and only. I shouldn't be anyway. Mm -hmm. That gets um, back to like everything. That and and self-advocacy. And, and self-advocacy with, stuff with, about, with, you know, with home you know, homeschooling, like, you know, and then yeah. like the veteran experience, because that is something, you know, people are starting to see growing numbers of, you know, neurodivergence, you know, in the military um, for various reasons. And so it's like, we're, we all have different things that we've all done kind of like individually here and there, but they all have a common goal. And so we thought consolidating mm -hmm. them together would be the best way to, to, um, to really, um, Save our you know, executive functioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and um, be able to, you know, like really promote what we're trying to do. Because like, again, we're all, we all have different things that we're involved in. You know, like I, I um, do equity work with AWN and support their mission and, you know, other groups, you know, but, but this is something that's like near and dear to the heart. Cause this is something that is applied. This is something that we do this right now. I see this right now. Those children that we worked with in that program, yeah. those friendships are formed and are blossoming. You know, the, you know, speech therapists that Osmond has trained or different people that we work with or the, you know, the, um, you know, providers that we did the roundtables for, those people have tools that are being implemented right now. Like, so we're, we're about, you know, what, what can you do today right now, for, you know, in the life that you live right now and the sphere of influence that you have and that's the way that we work and um and that's that's our passion yeah like that practical application is what changes lives yeah. right now yeah mm -hmm. we need yeah. you know you need the you need the the past you need the future you need the present and so like we feel like we thought you know legacy organizations that have been around that have helped you know really you know advance autism acceptance and, you know, and are doing things that will hopefully impact policy in the long run. Those are very, you know what I mean? Th those are longitudinal, <laughs> um, you know, goals. And, um, and so, oh, mentally does have to leave. Oh my gosh, and realize the past, the time um, went so fast, you know? And so like, we, we, we support like all of the, there's a, you know, we're happy to see more autistic led organizations. And we, you know, we work collaboratively with them in, in various different endeavors. Like there, this isn't competition. Like there are, we, there's too much need and our community is too, too small yeah. um, and too spread out for this to be. So this isn't like, okay, you know, um, 
you know, DC versus Marvel versus this versus that. It's not like that kind of thing. This isn't Pepsi versus, you know, Coca-Cola. Um, <laughs> there is no, um, you know, no strife and all of that with us and, and the other organizations. We, they are doing important work and we're doing important work and there's room for all of us at the table. Um, and so we just want to, you know, like to emphasize that, that we, you know, we're not here to, you know, undo anyone's work. We're here to do our own. Yeah. Um, so I think that all of that is like, we're one big autistic community. It's not like we aren't, all of us have friends within the other organizations. Yeah. It's not um, a pie. No, it's not a pie. It's like this huge big thing <laughs> there's 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 stuff like you can't just support one it's it's there's, like pudding or something i don't know there's some know. left you know <laughs> you can't just take a piece of support and oh now there's no support left there's there's plenty i mean the scarcity of resources is is fake it's not actually a scarcity of resources it's a scarcity of where people are willing to put resources mm-hmm. right and honestly, the resources are very available in non-autistic led mm-hmm. spaces. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. So, Absolutely. Like, so going back to like the big picture here, as far as like the community advocating and for parents, because parents also need to understand like part of the reason we got here today was because of parents, you know, 20, 30 years ago advocating for what they thought was going to help their kid because of how it was marketed to them. Um, And so parents today, Oswin, we've talked about this and I hope it's okay to say it. Parents today don't really take as much of an ally role. They, um, They might advocate to some extent, they might want to help their particular kids, but parents today need to try to become allies to the best of their ability because we need each other. Like, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That I speak of the autism groups where autistics inform parents. Those parents aren't our allies, they are their child's ally. Sometimes they're their child's ally. Sometimes, yes, sometimes, but they, they are... like to think they're their child's ally. Um, sometimes I feel like they're the ally of who they want their child to be. Yeah, and those are not the same. That ch- the child they have and the child they wish they had are not, o- or the child they think they have are not always the same person. And that's Um, why I think like what you were sharing, Jen, makes so much sense. Like what, you know, if people could have a paradigm shift, you know, there is no movement that has been successful. You know, like there's the stakeholders lead the movement and they are shored up and supported by the allies. That's what we've seen with suffrage movements, civil rights movements, with all types of, you know, like when you look at almost every movement, um, anti-imperialism, there've always been people, you know, who have like we, there's spaces that we can't get into. And there's people who will not listen to us for various reasons, but they'll listen to someone else. And so, you know, something Alicia Broderick said, Miranda Kay, was that if you are the commodity, then technically you can't be the stakeholder because Mm, that's deep. That is so so deep. (laughs) So that's why, like, you know, I I'm saying this to non-autistic people. You have to put yourself out there and you have to demand that things change and you have to get involved because you guys are out there um, putting yourselves through a lot of trauma and harm and trying to change this. But there are um, active forces against that happening. And so the rest of us who count as stakeholders need to be the ones to put more pressure for my gamers for my gamers tanking is ally work (laughs) y'all get to take those hits for us the ones that are gonna hurt really bad that we are tired of taking y'all get to tank for us that is part of your job the other part of your job is explaining things that we're tired of explaining 
Yes. And that there's a precedent for that. You know, we see that with, we see that in adoptive families and don't get me wrong. There's a whole lot of problematic adoptive parents out there too. I want to start that mm -hmm. conversation, but we see, you know, the allyship model and how it's been helpful. You see it in the HIV community. A lot of the people who are, you know, who are not living with HIV themselves, but have been allies have been ones to try to spread um, more awareness and more understanding and advocate for, you know, better treatment and better research. And so, you know, autism, we, the, shouldn't have to still be in the dark ages. It can be the same mm -hmm. thing. I think allies don't realize how much power they have, how much privilege they, or they can have. It's mm -hmm. not about just your one child or just yeah. your one life. It's about all of our lives, and all of us is, together. This is where I get into why we need uh, clinicians and educators to also be allies and not, and what I'm seeing more and more now, and I keep, I've been talking about it a little bit when I do some public things is that somehow um, providers have gone into a charity model of disability instead of a um, yeah. instead of staying in the medical model of disability of hey look we're providing space for autistic people now and don't we look good yeah <laughs> right it's very exploitative um yes. it's not and performative yeah, yeah. I don't want and space Cindy. either no I just want to be listened to mm -hmm. I want to be the table and y'all be back there Oh, supporting us. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, I obviously a thousand percent agree. <laughs> um, what do you, so mentally had to go, but what would the three of you like to leave everyone with as we wrap up? And, you know, I'd love to keep talking all day, but um, <laughs> I mean, I've got to go and <laughs> for this time, my kid <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to be presumed competent. Um, and I say that because when we're talking about all these things, what I see so much is that people don't believe we can be doing what we're doing because we're autistic, because we don't have the letters. We don't well, I mean, Marina Kay has letters, but the rest of us don't have letters. <laughs> um, believe that we actually, like, clearly if other people are plagiarizing us, mm -hmm. if people are taking our knowledge and what we've, what the community has grown up to learn from us collectively, yeah. how hard is it to just presume that we are doing this next step. And it seems to be really hard for people and I don't know why. Yeah. But like, I want people to come away recognizing we know what, we know exactly what we're doing and we have this really big vision that we know we will not see come to fruition. And we're still doing it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like that Hamilton quote, and I can't think of it exactly, but it's like, I may not be there to see the, you know, the, the win basically, but you know, you're going to continue to pursue that goal. Now I'm going to have the entirety of Hamilton running through my head today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, does anyone else want to say anything? We're going to have to end in like less than a minute. <laughs> um, I would like our community to stop simultaneously tough zoning us and acting like we don't know what we're doing. Like pick one. These things are mutually exclusive. So I would like you to pick please. And thank you. Pick, write it down and let us know which it is so that we know. Like we get, people are going to have their morals and their values. We're not going to try and change people on that. Yeah. But we're also not going to change ours. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I'd love for people to, to take away is that um, I think about anything else. Like I think about most music. I think about the music that I grew up with, you know, I'm from the, the remix generation. Everything is remade, everybody, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And we love that stuff. We take that old stuff, mix it into something new and people are doing it right now. You know, my daughter is into really 90s vintage vintage clothes. I told her if only I kept my stuff, you know, when I was, in, when I was growing up then she could have it instead of having to go buy it, you know? And so I feel like- 
Oh no, you disappeared, Mara. Oh, no. I, oh. I know my hand. And so I hope that. Yeah, sorry. I think I lost um, we hear you volume. Now. Yeah, but just for people to um, to look at the the energy and the of you know the energy and enthusiasm and the um, t- skills of the of the new and the knowledge you know and you know. Oh. Combine the two. Oh no, you cut out. There's like, so much cutting in and out. That's okay. Well, don't worry about it. Old, new, together. Miranda Kay, you can always uh, comment on the YouTube link if you want to um, leave it that way after. All right. Well, um, I think you're all amazing. I'm super grateful to you for all of your labor and your just like undeniable expertise and knowledge and just for being who you all are unapologetically and setting a really good example for everyone else. So um, thank you so much for being here. You know, I love talking with all of you. Um, Hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime soon. And um, thanks again. And to everybody watching, thank you for joining.